Now we've got a 60 year old recreational golfer with shoulder pain. So let's take you through the process. So you can see the left side of the probe is on the left side of the screen there. So the first thing you find for it, look for in the shoulder is the bicipital groove. So you're looking for the dip in the bone there. You can see the biceps tendon on top and you can see the deltoid going over the top with its intramuscular tendons. Now we can see some fluid around the biceps tendon. Now this is often a sign that there's just an intraarticular effusion. And we know that it's likely to be an intraarticular effusion because one, the sheath is continuous with the joint, but also when we look at the tendon, the tendon doesn't look thicker, it doesn't look heterogeneous. It looks like in transverse, it looks of normal thickness. And in long section, you can see that lovely fibula pattern of the tendon, which would indicate that this tendon is normal and therefore this fluid is coming from the biceps tendon um, sheath which will be coming from the joint. And we'd follow that tendon, just be avoid the anisotropy, so tilt the probe down until you get to the pectoralis major tendon attaching into the humerus there. We then follow it all the way up, we wait for the less tuberosity to fall away, and then we can look at it in the rotator interval here. Now, one of the first signs for looking for a subscapularis tear is to look at the location of the long head of biceps. If the long head of biceps is actually starting to migrate medially, particularly if it's sitting on top of the lesser tuberosity, then that may be an indication that particularly the superior fibers of subscapularis are torn because it's those fibers that actually form this transverse ligament that keeps the biceps into the groove. So when you're looking at the biceps tendon, have a look whether or not it's sitting on top of the lesser tuberosity. And you can also just do some dynamic movements um, just to see if there's any movement of that biceps tendon. You can also resist supination. Now, when we're looking at subscapularis, we're gonna put the patient into a laterally rotated position, and then we go and find the lesser tuberosity. Now we can see the lesser tuberosity here. Now there is some irregularity here, so we'll go into this in a little bit more detail at the moment. Now, one of the reasons I think that the subscap gets missed is because people don't line the fibers up correctly. So as you can see here, we've got the tendon, we've got the bone, we've got the subacromial bursa sitting in here. If you're not sure exactly where that space is, then you can just move and then you can see the um, subacromial bursal potential space in here. Now, we can also see the musculotendinous junction of subscap. Now, if you just have a look at um, the probe, we know that the subscap attaches onto the lesser tuberosity here, but it also attaches onto the anterior surface of the scapula. So you can see that it's going to be quite a fan-shaped muscle. And remember, it's got, um, it's got different tendon bundles as well. So you can't just visualize the tendon by being horizontal on the um, on the, uh, on the body. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna find the lesser tuberosity. And if you're saying that you're doing a long section, we must see the fibers in long, like we can see here. What I see all too often is that we're slightly oblique like this. And can you see that I'm oblique on the fibers? I'm not seeing the nice long fibers like I can here. So when you go to the inferior aspect of subscap, just make sure that you fishtail the medial side of the probe either down or up until, like we have there, we start to line up these fibers. So inferiorly, often you're slightly tilting the probe down to get the fibers really nicely there. And remember, as you go down further, it actually becomes quite muscular, the subscap. Now the middle fibers, which are the ones that often people will pick up quite easily, is quite a horizontal position. But the superior fibers, often you have to fishtail the probe up and look at that lovely image there of the subscap fibers in long section. But you can see the probe isn't horizontal. I've had to fishtail the medial side of the probe slightly superiorly. So make sure that you're scanning all the way through subscap. So that's my first tip. The second tip is to have a really careful look at this region here. Now this is the footprint. Remember this is the articular cartilage and the tendon will attach on into the footprint here. Now this looks like completely normal subscap, but just remember if you're not scanning it well, what you might end up with is some dark patches there. You can increase your gain, but I do see a lot of people calling these areas here. Now sometimes they can be, but this is where you need to really heal to tow the probe. So you're doing a rocking motion. So when we rock, and we heal down the probe, and quite a lot, 
I sacrificed this part of my image, but look at those lovely fibers going into the footprint because I'm now parallel. The probe is now parallel to those fibers. The beam is perpendicular. If I then tow down the probe and rock the other way, I get a really nice image of these more medial fibers, but obviously then I'm compromising this. So my next tip is just remember to do lots of heel and toe rocking at each point within those um, whether it's superior, inferior, or middle fibers. So there we go, we can see a dark patch, but when I push down, you can see that, and I'm pushing quite a lot, and I'm compromising this, but I can see that that fills in nicely. So my next tip is to make sure that you're rocking the probe to really look carefully, particularly at those footprint fibers, you're gonna really need to heal the probe down. Now, the next tip we're gonna look for is whether something is calcification or enthesopathy. So can we see here, there's a little bit, this looks like calcification, but we've also got this bone up here. Now, the only way you're gonna know the difference is to go transverse. Now, remember when we go transverse on subscap, we see these lovely bundles of the subscap. And remember, these are not tears in between these bundles. This is just an isotropy. Okay, this is the articular cartilage. And if I move the probe laterally, we go more into the footprint. Now, this is calcification because it's not attached on the, to the bone, the lesser tuberosity, whereas this is an enthesophyte because when I go laterally, can you see it just forms part of that lesser tuberosity? So that part of the bone that, if you like, has a small lip, if we go transverse and spin on it and follow towards the lesser, it's all continuous. So that means that that is an enthesophyte. So do look carefully there and make sure you're differentiating between a bit of calcification, as we can see here, and a small enthesophyte. So this is a normal subscapularis. Okay, now we're gonna look at this gentleman's supraspinatus. So remember this gentleman gets lateral shoulder pain and he's, got, he's a 60 year old recreational golfer. So you can see the left side of the screen is the left side. So to look for supraspinatus, the first thing I do is look for the bicipital groove. You can see the probe angling down to avoid that anisotropy. There's that fluid that we saw earlier. Then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna come around the side so the biceps comes to the bottom of the hill and then I'm just gonna heel down the probe to ensure I get a true transverse image of supra. Okay, so keeping that long head of biceps in view is really helpful to know where you are because you know that anything lateral that will be the leading edge of supra. Now you can see here, this is where the supraspinate is gonna come across uh, up in transverse section. And the first thing to look for is any dipping of the bursal plane or any flattening. So let's have a look at that as we come up and over. Good. Now we can see down here that you've got a nice rainbow view. Okay, we'll look at this tendon in a minute. But as we come up superiorly, can you see that there is some dipping of the bursal plane? Sometimes it's just a subtle flattening, but in this case, there is some dipping. Now we know if you see that, it is either a partial thickness of bursal sided tear or it is a full thickness tear because of the loss of volume. And in this case, we can actually see this is a full thickness tear running through here. Okay, and that is a small interface sign just above the articular cartilage, which is an artifact indicating that there is fluid sitting on, the, on top of the articular cartilage, which obviously shouldn't be the case. So you can see that now. So we can see that this is a full thickness tear. And the first indication, as I've already said, was the dipping of the bursal plane. Now we can see that this is the biceps tendon here. Now this is quite an interesting scan because remember what we can see here, if you remember back from your anatomy, is you've got your coracohumeral ligament that is actually, and that you can see the long fibers that is actually going on top of the articular cartilage. Now, interestingly, this is the coracohumeral ligament, this white band. So don't be fooled that that means that, that you may think that that is some deep fibers or articular sided supraspinatus fibers, but it's actually a, the supraspinatus fibers should be on top and this is the tear. The tear goes from this anterior edge of uh, supraspinatus and it goes all the way to infraspinatus. Now, what else can we see on? on here. Well, we will confirm this in long section in a minute, but as we've got this nice view, this is the coracohumeral ligament and this is supraspinatus and it is slightly thicker. So there is some tendinopathic change. You can see this is heterogeneous to supraspinatus. Again, we will confirm that on the uh, long view, 
This is now the tear in transverse, and then we can pick up some tendon again here. But now we're going into infraspinatus, and already you should be able to see that infraspinatus is tendinopathic here. And again, we'll look at that in more detail, but that is tendinopathy of infraspinatus. You can see the thickening here, and then you've got this thin area, and then you've got some thickening, a bit more subtle at the front there. So now let's have a look at this long section, but the key learning point here is this is the coracohumeral ligament, and the fact that this is intact is hopefully a good sign that there's still some cuff function, which from testing this gentleman earlier, I can tell you there is. So remember the coracohumeral ligament goes over the top of the biceps, and then it then goes above and below supraspinatus and you can see that this is the tear. If I were to measure the tear, now it will vary person to person where the measurement is, but generally speaking, I would suggest that this is a, a tear of around one centimeter at this point, um, and it is a little bit more of a proximal tear. It's not, or doesn't appear to be at the footprint, but we'll have a look at that in a bit more detail now. So if we then go to a long section, okay, we can see here, um, we can see some tendon, but let's find out exactly where we are. Because if I then just push forward, make sure the patient still has that extension that we need. As we push forward, there's the long head of biceps. As we come back, this is obviously where we're going to get supraspinatus, okay? So let's have a look at supraspinatus first. We can see it's definitely heterogeneous here. This is the footprint, and we can see there's a bit of an enthesophyte here as well. You can see, but we can see supraspinatus here and we can see the footprint doesn't look too bad. And remember, like we said with the subscap, you must rock, heel the probe in, and then tow the probe. So you can look at, the, when you tow the probe, you'll see the more proximal fibers. When you heal, and you can see I'm healing a lot to compromise that, you can see that this is tendinopathic, and there's probably a small partial thickness tear there at the articular surface. However, that is not the main uh, injury here. What we can see here, this is the rotator cable, but you can see how flat the bursal plane is here, even in long section. So we can see that this is a proximal tear of the supraspinatus. Can you see that this is quite thin? Now, this is the anterior leading edge. As we come over the back of the greater tuberosity, that's where you can see your infraspinatus, and that is definitely tendinopathic. We're not seeing any significant tears there, but certainly as we come over, you should be able to identify that that is quite a tendinopathic infraspinatus. As if we have a look at infraspinatus in long section, we can just pop that elbow relaxed into the side, and then we're just following that now in long section. You can follow it all the way around to the back of the joint, which is down here. Here's infraspinatus, nice fibula pattern. But as we come forward, uh, particularly in the superior fibers, you can see that thickening of the tendon, which would be indicative of infraspinatus tendinopathy. Now we're going to look at an acromioclavicular joint. So left side of the um, probe is the left side of the screen. So we can see the acromioclavicular joint here. It's slightly more posterior than often people think, and they do struggle sometimes to find it. We can see the superior capsule going over the top. Now we can see on the acromium side, there is some cortical regularity. There is also some osteophytic formation, and that is exactly the same on the clavicular side. Now this is quite common. You need to obviously palpate the joint as well to see if that is clinically where their pain is but also we can have a look at some laxity of the joint. Now there's two types of laxity. There's one called vertical laxity, which is where you're trying to, what you want to see is that the height between the acromium and the clavicular end stay quite similar and they don't move up and down. And then there's horizontal laxity, which is where you get an increased gapping of the joint here. So let's first of all, look at this dynamically. You can add a weight to the hand. But if we just ask our patient to slowly bring the arm forward, good, and just hold it there, you can see as we go into flexion, there's definitely some compression and you're getting some slight mushrooming of the superior capsule as there is likely to be some fluid in this joint. You can then ask your patient to come across their neck, a scarf test, and obviously that is your provocation test. And then you can see that bunching of the AC joint. If we just rotate that back slowly, then we can have a look to see whether there's any vertical laxity or horizontal. And if you just drop the arm down to the side, you can see that overall 
It does slightly widen at the end and there is a slight bit of vertical laxity there, but actually this is a reasonably stable acromioclavicular joint. You can see the fluid in the joint there. If you just bring your arm out to the side, you can see some fluid moving a little bit there and then come back down. But it's absolutely essential that when you have a look at an acromioclavicular joint, you do put it together with your clinical findings as well, because there is so much asymptomatic pathology, even over the age of 30. Did you find that video useful? If you did, don't worry, we've got loads more videos for you. You can like our videos, you can make a comment, you can subscribe to our channel to get all of our new videos, and you can even join our membership. Good luck scanning.